Hello, I'm James McDougall. I'm a Chancery Barrister at Ten Old Square with a special focus on trusts and inheritance law. And these are my top three current unresolved points in trust law. Trustees' privilege in documents. It is often said that where a trustee receives legal advice in relation to its trusts, they cannot assert legal privilege against the beneficiaries, particularly if the advice has been paid for out of the fund. This has been the prevailing view since the 19th century, but can it really be right? 19th century judgments presupposed that a fixed interest beneficiary had a proprietary interest in the trust documents. One can see how this assumption naturally led uh, to supposing that any privilege in those documents was held for the beneficiaries. However, the modern law of trust disclosure uh, devolves from Lord Walker's Privy Council speech in the case of Schmidt and Rosewood Trust Company, in which the proprietary nature uh, of the beneficiaries' rights in trust documents and even the usefulness of trying to uh, define so-called trust documents was doubted. The power to order disclosure is now seen as part of the court's supervisory jurisdiction of trusts uh, rather than as giving effect to any substantive right of the beneficiaries. So if beneficiaries do not have an automatic right to inspect trust documents, why should it be assumed that they can share in the trustees' right of privilege? Surely the privilege inures for the benefit of the trustees, at least until an order is made that disclosure be made to the beneficiaries. The effect of an order to vary a trust. When the court makes an order under the Variation of Trusts Act 1958, the traditional view is that the court is merely supplying consent on behalf of those beneficiaries who would be unable to give it, and that this allows the variation to be affected by all the other participating competent adult beneficiaries. However, one opposing view is that the court order actually affects the variation. This would explain why, in practice, the agreement of the adult beneficiaries to make dispositions of their equitable interests can be confirmed orally at the hearing by counsel and need not be in writing, as might otherwise be required by statute. Alternatively, it may be that the beneficiary's agreement to the variation is not a disposition within the meaning of the Law of Property Act uh, and does not therefore require written confirmation. This would clear the way for saying that the court order is merely supplying the consent on behalf of the unborn and minor beneficiaries. Uh, in most cases, the question will not arise because the adult beneficiaries will give written agreement to the variation or will be joined to the action. Has a trustee disclaimed a trust? A trustee appointed by a will is not obliged to accept office, even if he previously agreed with the testator in his lifetime that he would act. It is said that trust property will vest immediately in the appointed trustee before he is aware of the appointment, even if the trusts are onerous, but that nevertheless the trustee will have an opportunity thereafter to accept or disclaim the trust. But what if the trustee does not take any steps at all? Should it be inferred from his inaction uh, that he has accepted or disclaimed the appointment? The historic view is that a trustee who knows he is appointed but does nothing is taken to accept the office. But in Clout and Frewer's contract in 1924, the appointed trustee, who did nothing for 30 years after his appointment, was taken never to have accepted the trusteeship. The conclusion in each case is likely to be fact sensitive, but the proper evidential presumption in cases where the appointed trustee has remained silent and inactive for a period of time is the subject of conflicting authorities, and therefore the pet point remains unresolved. Thank you for listening. Those were my top three unresolved points of trust law.